Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career planning and leadership development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and excited to bring you a special episode. That's right, this is episode number 150, and I hope it will continue to help you become the kind of leader you want to be in the nonprofit sector. Thanks for listening. Whether you have been with us for a long while or maybe now just tuning in, I really appreciate it. If you want to be a nonprofit leader or maybe more effective in the role you're in now, you're in the right place. I'm glad to bring you these weekly conversations with nonprofit experts who really are on the cutting edge of our sector. And if you would, do me a favor. Share this episode with just one other person. Just find the share button. Usually it's at the top of the episode graphic on the device you're holding right now. And you can share by email or text or any other manner. Share this with one other person so that we can continue to build a global community focused on nonprofit leadership. Now, once again, I had a fantastic conversation this episode with Rhea Wong, who brings such good experience, hands-on experience, as a former executive director and fundraiser herself, and now a coach, consultant, and trainer in perhaps the most fundamental aspect of nonprofit leadership, and that is, of course, fundraising. Now, I get it. You may not be totally comfortable as a fundraiser, and that's okay. It's exactly why I wanted Rhea on this episode, because it's, in fact, a superpower of hers. She had to go through some of the same barriers or challenges that perhaps you're facing right now, And she's turned those challenges now into opportunities in her coaching and teaching. And she's going to bring you ideas that will help you become a more comfortable fundraiser. And it starts, in fact, with your fundraising mindset. Not only will she unpack that concept of fundraising mindset and all of the related issues that might be slowing you down, she's going to give you good ideas that will help you be more effective going forward. Lots of reasons to check out the show notes. Once again, this is episode number 150. Just go to the podcast or the news page at patmcdowell.com and you'll find out all of the resources that Rhea and I discussed, as well as more information on the great work she's doing through her consulting practice, her wonderful podcast, by the way, check it out. It's called The Nonprofit Lowdown. And speaking of putting a book out into the world, you need to add Rhea's new book, It's called Get That Money, Honey. And yes, I'll say that again. Get That Money, Honey. It's literally available today as this episode is released, and you'll need to add it to your wish list for sure. Speaking of new publications, thank you so much for your support of my book titled Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, just like this podcast, easy to remember. And I'm grateful for all of the support. If you are interested in getting that on your reading list, just go to pattonmcdowell.com forward slash book and you'll find all the ways to get either a print or an electronic copy. Connect with us. We're on all the primary social media platforms and you certainly can get on our email list, bottom of the homepage, labeled free resources. That'll get you in the door and you won't miss out on any of the resources we are providing, including podcast episodes just like this one. They come out every Thursday morning, and you don't want to miss them. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Rhea Wong. Rhea, thank you for joining me on the path. It is such a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm excited about this conversation. You do fantastic work in the nonprofit and fundraising scene. You have wonderful programs to help nonprofit professionals get better at fundraising in particular. And you've got a wonderful podcast. And as a fan myself, delighted to have you on my podcast. And I know you'll bring the experience of many guests that you have uh, spoken with about topics like the one we're going to talk about. And let's jump right into it. We're going to hear your story. But I want to first ask you the question, why do so many nonprofit leaders struggle with fundraising. Oh, Patton, that is the million dollar question, is it not? Indeed. I mean, for me, I really think that so much of it stems from these internal blockages, right? So in our society, it's not polite to talk about money, right? There are people who'd rather stick hot needles in their eye than ask for money. And 
And I get it, you know, we're socialized in some kind of way, we're brought up in a certain kind of way, we might have been taught that like we don't talk about money, or money is tight, or money is scarce, or money doesn't grow on trees, or we're not the Rockefellers, or whatever else you might have heard in your childhood. And so we, we internalize all of that stuff. And then we grow up, we become fundraisers. And we go out in the world, assuming that we, and, you know, that we can go and ask for money without all of this other internal stuff getting in our way. And so what I really believe is the reason why people dislike fundraising, are not good at it, would rather not do it, is that they really have not wrestled and come to terms with their own relationship with money and, and scarcity and their own blockages and beliefs about money, that it's scarce, that it, it's hard to come by, that you have to fight for it, that rich people are different, that they must have done something bad to get their money. I mean, you know, fill in the dots with, with any kind of story that you want. Money is just money. You know, money is just a piece of paper. Right. We create so much drama about it. And it's really the drama that keeps us from being as successful as we want to be. Well, you were successful in the nonprofit space yourself. So you know about which you speak. Uh, as a fellow fundraiser, I remember some of the breakthrough moments. But tell me, did you have a breakthrough moment where you had to get your arms around this kind of uh, relationship with money to become a more effective fundraiser? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked about it. So I talk about this a lot. I was a 26 year old executive director, right? So you know, basically they handed me the keys, they gave me my email address and they said, good luck. <laughs> and so the first day on the job, I'm not even kidding. The first day on the job, I did two Google searches. The first was, uh, what does an executive director do? <laughs> wow. And the second was how to fundraise. I mean, I was super, super clueless, right? And so, and at the time it was like a $250,000 a year work. So, you know, fairly modest, but not sure. nothing. And, um, and I just remember like, okay, I got to figure out this fundraising thing. So I decided to self-educate, right? I basically created a, my own personal MBA. I read everything I could get my hands on. I went to all of the seminars, you know, the free ones, the paid ones, you know, I did the program up at Columbia, at the Columbia business school. I, you know, I was in it to win it. Wow. Um, but the thing is, even so, I never felt like fundraising was something I enjoyed. I felt like it was a necessary evil to the job. Right. And it wasn't really until I did an amazing course uh, with Jennifer McCray at Harvard that it kind of clicked for me that, wait a second, what if I'm holding on to all of this baggage about money? And I remember this because I grew up in San Francisco in the 80s and 90s, and it was in the height of the crack and AIDS epidemic. And yes, if you've yes. ever been to San Francisco, you know, there, there are lots of homeless people. Right. And um, I remember I was eight years old and I was walking down the street and there was a, an older, you know, homeless man with a sign that said, you know, a uh, homeless vet, uh, please help something like that. And I was eight. So of course, you know, he looked ancient to me, but he was honest, they probably only in his forties. Anyway, the point is I, I reached into my pocket and I gave him a quarter. I remember my father whipped around and he said, Oh, you're, so you're so rich now. You could just give money away. Uh. Right. Because you know, I didn't grow up in a philanthropic family. My family, my grandparents were from China. They escaped you know, the communists in China. And so typical American story came to the U.S. with $20 in their pockets and they you know, built their way up. Um, and so in my family, money meant stability. Money right. meant security. And so psychologically, I had, I had uh, inculcated in my mind that giving money away meant giving away stability, giving away security. And then I projected that assumption onto my donors, right? So I never loved fundraising because psychologically, subconsciously, I was believing that I was asking them to give up their security and that I was somehow asking them to experience the shame that I had experienced as an eight-year-old when I got in trouble for giving a quarter. Giving it away, right. right. You know, fast forward. So it was early on in my career. I was probably in my early 30s at this point. And I met this woman named Liz at a uh, a tennis benefit that one of my board members was giving. And she, you know, she's a very intense woman, like 50s, like powerhouse, Upper East Side, like New Yorker. Um, and she kind of cornered me. We got into conversation, just very intense, like shooting questions at me. I was like, ah, what's happening? Anyway, um, She's incredibly smart. And I eventually invited her to consider joining our board. So she said, okay, um, send me the budget. And so I sent her the budget. She calls me two days later. I'm like, just like, I have to talk to you. I'm like sweating at this point. Uh, <laughs> right, like, right. And she said, she said, Rhea, I'm, I'm looking at this budget and it looks here like your entire board is giving 
$30,000 collectively. And I was like, um, yeah. And she goes, well, that's unacceptable. Uh, any board that I join needs to be giving at a more significant level. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to challenge them to match me at 50. Wow. And if they do that, I'll throw on another 50. And it was just like, poof, like my head exploded. Nice. And I was like, wait a second. What if everything I thought about money is actually wrong? Like, what if there are people in this world like Liz who enjoy giving money, who see it as a as a privilege, who see it as a, their responsibility? And what if there are a whole bunch of other Liz's out there in the world? And it just really opened my mind to a whole new perspective about money and abundance and and partnership and inspiration. And since that time, I love fundraising because fundraising is not about the money. It's about the relationship. Yes. Anyway, very long-winded way. <laughs> love it. I'm answering the question. Well, and and did, did, did you find that many of your colleagues perhaps shared some of those same fears and thus you're like, hey, I can help other people. And thus your consulting and coaching practice yeah. began? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So once I um, left being an executive director after 12 years, 12 and a half years, I feel like I have to add the half because yeah. as you know, being an ED, it counts. <laughs> it counts. Yeah, right. Um, you know, I was kind of looking for my next thing, wasn't exactly sure what to do. And then, you know, I took on a couple of consulting projects. I know that's what you do. And um, listen, you know, for, on my side, it wasn't really that strategic. I was like, oh, I have friends. They need help. I can help them. Right, right. And then kind of mid pandemic, it really occurred to me like, oh, what's the number one problem that nonprofits have is they need fundraising. And what's the thing I'm particularly good at is fundraising. But more than that, for me, it's it's really about service because at the end of the day, I care about a lot of different issues. I care about education and I care about the environment. I care about voting rights. I care, like I care about a lot of things, but exactly. I personally am not gonna be able to do all of the things, right? I'm one person. I can't do all of it. So what I decided to do was to develop this program to help support people who are doing all the things. And so for me, it was like a, it was a win win. It was a way for me to earn a living, yeah. <laughs> share what I've learned, but also support work that I care about in a in an indirect way. I love that. And again, you are indeed kind of spreading that uh, the intellect you've brought to the fundraising space and helping others then achieve their mission, right? So you can, in fact, impact multiple missions through the the lens of fundraising and helping them build the assets they need. I, I hope so. I mean, you know, what I've said, um, and I'm, I hope, I hope I'm very humble about it. I hope it comes across. But you know, the fact is, I've made a lot of mistakes. I made mistakes so you don't have to is what I tell my students. Right? I'm not saying it. I'm the be all end all. I don't know everything in the whole wide world, but I know more than they do at this point. And so what I want to do is help them to sort of level up quicker than I did, because the truth of the matter is like, and I'm sure you found this to be the case, is a lot of it was trial and error. I didn't yes. have somebody to tell me all of the things, right? I mean, I took the courses and so on, but at the end of the day, you learn by doing. And I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes, and that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> yes, but indeed. I'm like, let me let me help people learn from my mistakes. And you all should make new and different mistakes. Don't make the old mistakes. I already did that. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. And well, and I guess all that came together. Talk about the fundraising accelerator. You've got a really unique and innovative program that gets it. I, I know you get it, the fundraising tactics, but of course, to your earlier point, I think what you believe is that it's not tactical issues that are holding up most of our fundraising colleagues, right? Or nonprofit leaders. It's that yeah, whole relationship yeah. with money. But is that how, talk about fundraising accelerate. How did that come together? Yeah. So it's an interesting story because basically I was getting approached by everyone uh, to help with development work. Right. And I'm not I mean, I've done development as part of my job, obviously a fundraise, but I'm not a development director, right? I, I'm an executive director. Um, and as you know, most small nonprofits don't have a director of development or they might have a development associate, but everyone was like coming and looking for someone to do this thing. And I was like, well, the thing is, you can't really outsource development work, especially if you're the executive director. And the thing that blows everyone's minds is like, I say this a lot, 65 to 80% of your time as an ED should be spent on fundraising, right? Oh. And so I think a lot of people think, especially founders, they, they you know, they start the organization because they love the panda bears or whatever it else, they, <laughs> right. they, you know. The passion that got them there, right? Right, the passion project. 
And I'm like, well, here's a great irony. When you become more successful, you actually get to do less of the thing that you love to do. Like you don't, you don't get to hang out with the kids anymore. You don't get to do the tutoring. You don't get to do the volunteer stuff. You hire other people to do it because you need to be a fundraiser. And that's just the truth of it. And so to me, I was like, well, this is kind of dumb. Like, why are we all running around trying to find fundraisers when number one, we know that there aren't enough people in the pool, but number two, like, how is it that we all have our, these jobs that we've actually never been properly trained to do? Like, right. Like how many EDs are told you're an ED now. And by the way, fundraising is part of your job. Like how many surgeons would you put in a hospital without having gone to medical school? How many lawyers get to practice law without having gone to law school, right? How many mechanics get to work on cars without having learned how to, I don't know, when you go to auto bodies, I don't know what you go to training. There's a training program involved. Yes. Right. And and yet we put, yeah, we put them in there. Yeah, it's like we are trying to solve the society's most intractable problems, and yet we actually haven't properly trained people to do the job that we're asking them to do. So here's what happens. Either one of two things happens. Either A, people really try their hardest and they end up getting burned out, or they figure it out and then they decide to go elsewhere and take their talents somewhere else, right? So to me, I was like, well, why don't we just work with what we got (laughs) and teach EDs? how to fundraise and teach development directors how to fundraise to actually help them to be good at their jobs. Like, I don't know, it seems kind of (laughs) obvious and logical to me, but apparently the the nonprofit sector still needs to catch up with that. That was so well put. And and I guess that you anticipated my next question of the ideal candidate for your program is that executive director who doesn't necessarily have the infrastructure of a chief development officer. I mean, do you help them evolve to that space? I mean, they need to retain that fundraising ability, no matter how many staff they put around them. But yeah, I wonder, how do you speak to that evolution? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So the majority of people in my program are actually executive directors. I do have a handful of development directors, yeah. um, but generally the development directors are there to help learn how to manage their, their exec to do the fundraising work. Right. Um, but, you know, I think as executive directors, as CEOs, we really need to, first of all, just accept the fact that the job is fundraising, right? Like I I know a lot of people say a lot of things about like, well, it's about like the strategy and the blah, 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 and the board recruit. I'm like, no, 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 it's actually about fundraising. It's it's rooted in the fundraising, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like, that's what your job is. I want to accept that. And number two, uh, accept that you might want to get better at it, right? Um, and I think uh, the thing that drives me crazy. So, Patton, can I just share what the, uh, what's like the bee in my bonnet? Please do. Is okay. So, my accelerator program is not cheap, right? It's 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 significant investment, but I also have um, a guarantee, which is that if you don't make up the cost of tuition in six months, implementing my strategies, I'll refund your money. So it's like uh, risk free. Absolutely. And I have all these testimonials saying that people have 3x, 4x, 10x, 40x their initial investment, right? So to me, I'm like, this is kind of a no-brainer. Like, you literally cannot lose money on this deal. You might be surprised at how many people hear the thing, get really excited, then hear the price, and they're like, nope, can't afford it. Because so much in the nonprofit sector is we don't think about investment for the long term. We don't think about what's the ROI. We just see it as an expense. And so what ends up happening is like you choke off uh, what is ultimately going to be the the golden goose, right? Right. You need to think about the long term. And look, if, if people don't want to do my program because they believe that I can't help them, like, that's fine. That's a different. That's issue. one thing. Right. Like, that's one thing. You know, that's fine. I'm not in the business of persuading people. <laughs> if you don't think I'm I know what I'm talking about. If you don't think my taxes are, are going to work for you, like, please go go talk to somebody else. That's fine. My feelings are not hurt. But if you're not investing in the program because you can't afford it, but you you can't see the longer term ROI, then I think you've got to shift your mindset. We got another so issue. It goes back to the original point. Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. So, and it, well, it reinforces your point, Rhea, right, of, of just the psychology of money. And, and if we as an executive right. director or a manager of a nonprofit are not willing to invest, it's short-sighted. And, and we're never going to move exactly out right. of, right, whatever limitations we have. And But I'm guessing the people that sign up for the accelerator, Rhea, have a better mindset, but you still 
I'm guessing early on still work with them on mindset issues, right? Before you jump to the yeah. tactical advice, is that oh. fair? Oh, 100%. So the first module we do, and actually uh, we're starting a new cohort on Friday, is it's all about money mindset, right? Because yep. again, it goes back to my fundamental belief. You can't, you can't do until you, until you are, right? Like if right. you don't believe yourself to be the kind of person who can ask for big gifts, if you feel like you're scared of money, if you're scared of rich people, if you have all this sort of baggage, and I can give you all the tactics all day long, right? But you have to see yourself as the kind of person who can execute on those tactics. Right. So it's it's really like a mind shift. It's like, for example, you know, I I don't smoke cigarettes, not because I have actively decided not, you know, it's it's not like I'm tempted to smoke cigarettes. I don't smoke <laughs> right. cigarettes because I am not a smoker. Like right. I have the identity of a non-smoker. Right. And so similarly, people in my program, they need to embrace this identity of being a fundraiser not just a fundraiser i feel like fundraiser sort of cheapens it a little bit right i think of it as being a facilitator of resources right i we are just i think there's nothing more revolutionary in this world than being a fundraiser you're, you're moving capital from one place to another in order for great things to happen and if we can really embrace our roles as facilitators of action it changes the whole conversation then and it also becomes not personal i think people take rejection so personally yes it's, indeed. Like, it's not personal it's not about you like they're not saying i hate you Patton. right they're saying it's not for me this is not right. my thing it's maybe not thing. now there are right? lots of things right? right maybe not now maybe not this project maybe not the amount that you asked exactly. but it's not you know the fact is like they're already talking to you like there's some level of they already like you because as you know people value time more than they value money so if i'm giving you my time i already have some level of trust in you and just because i'm not going to sign up for your thing right now just because i'm not going to give you money right now doesn't mean never ever or and it also doesn't mean anything personal about you yeah that's so well put and i love the way you articulate that and it i, I guess there's several concepts in your program that i'd love to lift up uh, and you alluded to this earlier, kind of the how do we deepen the donor relationship, particularly as a nonprofit professional, Rhea, if I didn't grow up in with money, as your story personally attests. So how do we deepen the donor relationship if we don't, frankly, come from money? Yeah, well, Patton, I think the thing, the big misconception, and I said it before, is this belief that fundraising is about money. It's not about money. It's about the right. relationship, Right. And so my favorite thing, and all my students know this, everyone who's ever listened to me knows this, like I use a dating analogy because I, I think that the way in which fundraising is generally taught or thought is like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to like strategize, there's going to be some like magical combination of words I'm going to say that'll make someone throw money at me, I'm going to have a fancy deck, you know, blah, 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 all of the things. I don't know about you. I have never raised money off the back of a fancy deck, right? Right. It's about the conversation. It's about ongoing. It's about the relationship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, to me, walking into a meeting with like a fancy deck and a pitch is the same as walking into a first date with a resume and telling the person you're on a date with, like, these are all the great things about me. I went to this school. This is my GPA. This is my SAT score. <laughs> all right, great. I'm great, right? <laughs> Good luck getting a second date. Right. Well, it's so like asking them to me, marry you, right? It's like on the first date going straight for the oh, yeah. ultimate question. Oh, yeah. And like, wow, that was a little premature. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I just really uh, encourage people to think of their don't like they're just people that like they're not different. We're basically humans are pretty much wired the same way, more or less, right? We yeah. want to we want to be seen. We want to be able to talk to ourselves. We want to see ourselves as a hero of our own story. And we want people to ask questions about ourselves. Like think about the best dates that you were ever on. It was a conversation. Someone was interested in you. They asked you good questions about yourself. You enjoyed the the time together. You, you know, I, I'm assuming, but like I'm <laughs> you you invested in the relationship and it eventually went somewhere, right? But it's exactly. you really just have to not think about it. Like I think that the problem that I see in fundraising is people think of the relationships so transactionally. It's like I'm gonna go in, punch these buttons, and money's gonna pop out. I'm like, really? It's <laughs> such a good point. Out for you? No, it doesn't. And you're right, but we we have that kind of built-in 
equation uh, between donor and fundraiser instead of we have a shared uh, passion for the mission, right? These are individuals okay. that love our mission. There is alignment. And yet I think we create the barrier, right? Is what you're saying. We create a barrier by making them kind of donor to fundraiser instead of someone sharing a cause that we are aligned with. Yeah. I, yeah. And I think a lot of the stuff around like pitched, like I'm actually on a single woman mission to get rid of the word pitch. Like I hear people say pitch transactional, like it, it right there. Crazy. Yep. It, transactional. I mean, it, it comes from like the VC world or Wall Street. Like I don't know where it comes from, but it's terrible. Because the other thing is, I don't know why it's so hard for people, but I'm like, really, do you do you like being on the receiving end of a pitch? Do you like it when someone is just talking at you for 10 minutes without pause? Okay. Yeah, then why are you so doing you that? Like it, right. Why are you doing that? And it, it, it's because I think people are so uncomfortable with the money and people with wealth that they create this uh, barrier, as you were saying, or they create this arm's length to actually instead stepping into a conversation about being human. Like, what do you care about? What do we care about? And is there something here that we can do together? And maybe not, right? Like, I think the other thing is we also have to be okay with someone saying, you know, Maria, I, I love what you're doing. I think it's great, but this is not my thing. Right. That's great. Like that's okay. It's fine. It's okay. Bless and release. Like move on. And actually, I'm glad when people tell me it's not the thing because then I stop wasting my time. Well, I love how you put that. And it, I think we could tie that to board uh, fundraising <laughs> as well, right? And so let's talk about that. Oh. You you had a great illustration, but our board members are nervous about it in some cases. So, so how do we break through? And what do you suggest? to get our board members more engaged in fundraising? Yeah, so Patton, I think that the number one mistake that we all make, and you know what they say about assuming, <laughs> is that we assume <laughs> yes, that board members, especially board members who we consider to be wealthy, we assume that they have no baggage about money. <laughs> or, or we assume that because they're in sales or whatever, like a big corporate job that they don't have any baggage about money, that they have no problem with asking for the sale or asking for the money. Again, when you assume. So I think the number one thing here is that we have to, first of all, recognize that our boards need to be trained. Like they need yeah. to do some of the work of unpacking their own money baggage, right? Second thing is board members need to understand what the fundraising cycle looks like. I think a lot of them think that it's just about the solicitation. But as you know, the vast majority of the time in fundraising is spent building the relationship or continuing to invest in the relationship after the solicitation. And so if board members think it's just about asking for money, We've got of course, start they there. Hate it. like I would hate it. Right. right? At the, the gift is just a natural step in a process after you have established where you're going in the relationship. And so. Um, I think there's education. And then I think the third thing is really like having individual conversations with each board member, because I think the other thing is as EDs, we were like, well, I sent out an email and like nobody responded well, yeah. or like nobody did the thing that we, you know, I, I know you have kids, Pat. And it's like when you like yell at all your kids to clean the room, guess what? Does anyone actually <laughs> clean their room? <laughs> kids, no. clean your room. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah that's going to be wrong. Right. We're going to be no yelling that a responsible. long time. Right. Right. And so essentially that's the same thing with ED. It's like we're yelling into the void, like how could, like introduce me to people. Like, how's that working out for you? So and well. So, <laughs> so we need to sit down with each board member and figure out like what are you willing to do? Right. I have a board menu that I put together and you can check off the box and be like, okay, I'm gonna do this, this, and this this year, and this is what I'm committed to. And then you just project manage them to do the thing. But again, you have children, you know, kids are never gonna do what they're just not gonna do. Same with grownups. At the end of the day, you can't force anyone to do anything that they're not going to do. Well, and so exactly right. One size does not fit all. And love the yeah. model use of the, the the kind of philanthropic cycle or development cycle, fundraising cycle. Most organizations have some variation, but you're right. And it seems to me that, Rhea, that becomes part of your one-on-one -on -one conversation with each board member, right? The, the message That's can be, exactly look. Right. You know, I, I don't care exactly where you plug. I like you to plug in somewhere on the cycle. So if it's not the solicitation phase, but maybe it's stewardship, maybe you're part of the thank you effort or you get us in the door and cultivate and communicate. But I, is that the nature of the one on one kind of staff to board That's conversations exactly right. you're encouraging? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I like to say clear is kind, right? Yeah. So the yeah. clearer you are, the kinder you are, and the more likely people will, will be to do the thing that you're asking them to do. Like one example, I had one board member who, or she was, she and her husband were quite wealthy, but she was like, no way, no how, I am never, ever, 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 ever going to ask any of my friends for money. So that just, it's a non-starter. I was like, okay. So we had a $30,000 gift again. And I was like, so first of all, like if you're comfortable with just writing a $30,000 check, she's like, yeah, fine, done. But like, that's, that's that was the easy happened. part. And I, was like, right. oh. and I was like, okay, that's fine. And then I really plugged into, she happened to have this beautiful house on the upper east side and loved hosting parties. Loved it. So I was like, okay, how about we do this? Would you agree to host our annual, you know, I think we had a major donor party every spring just to, you know, thank our major donors. Yes, love to do that. The thing is, she didn't know that was fundraising, right? But again, it's about finding the thing that everybody is willing and excited to do. And she loved it. And like, she got to show off her house. You know, she felt like, you know, the hostess with the mostest. We got to it's have a, win -win. a good place to host our, you know, our donors. So it's about... Are you a are you a sports fan, Patton? Yeah, uh, indeed, I am. Yes, <laughs> I, I would assume so. Being primarily, a, <laughs> but well, yes, a, a North Carolina man yourself. Well, it's it's like you know, I always see it as being a coach. Like right? you have to understand who your players are, you have to understand what they're good at, and you have to understand how to utilize their talents for the betterment of the team and the goal, right? Like not every player is going to be your, your three-point shooter. Not every player is gonna be good on defense, right? But you, you have to know what you're working with here. Now, the problem is if you have board members who won't get off the bench, like then that's a different problem. Right. But, you know, if you're willing to have people who are willing to get on the field and play or get on the court and play, like you gotta figure out how to maximize their talents. Well put. Uh, and of course, yeah, love a sports analogy. And uh, they, they all have talents. And you're right back to your one on one conversations. You know, that's how you can lift those up and find a way because yeah. I'm convinced really, a lot of those board members come in their their history with philanthropy is not really philanthropic. It's transactional. The last nonprofit yeah. board I was on, they just wanted me to sell tickets or sponsorships or, you know, create, you know, table host kind of experiments. And, and they're tired of chasing their friends and family for transactional activity so you're helping yeah. re-educate them as to real philanthropy well the other piece too Pat, and, and, and this is just another bee in my i have a lot of bees in my bonnet but one of the things <laughs> that um, really bothers me is when you know EDs will say like well i've asked my board to introduce me to people yeah. like introduce me to right so there are two problems with that number one that's too general. Like I'm a busy person. I, I don't have time to sit and think like, who should I introduce patent to? Right. 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 Instead, you need to do the work, like make it easy to do business with. So as an ED or a DOD or whoever, your job is to go and find the list of people that you might want to be introduced to and put it in front of your board. Agreed. So like that's number one. Don't make them do the work. 100%. Number two, be really specific about what you intend to do because the thing, the reason they're not opening their network is that they don't trust you. They don't know what you're going to do with their people. And frankly, if you came to me and you're like, introduce me to people. And if I thought the thing that you were going to do was just like straight away ask them for money without creating any kind of relationship, I wouldn't give you my contacts either because it makes Absolutely. it awkward for me. Yep. Like I'm going to see this person next Saturday night and I don't want them coming to me like, Rhea, why'd you give my name to that person? They just asked me for a bunch of money. So don't embarrass people. And I think be really clear about what is what am I going to do? What is the email I'm going to send? What is the process we're going to follow? And what are the points at which these people can also say, like, this is not my thing? Because like that's the other thing is no one wants to have their friends and family feel pressured to give. Like we're not in the business of pressuring, we're in the business of inviting people. That's so well put. And and again, yet another kind of mindset shift. Uh, consistent with the title of this episode. It's all about mindset, right, Rhea? If we can change that yeah, mindset I mean, at many levels, things are going to get better. Well, I think ultimately so much of the bad, the bad practices in fundraising is really couched in a scarcity mindset. It's this belief that there are not going to be enough people. There are not going to be enough resources. If I don't close this gift, this is never going to happen again. Like, you know, people are not out there being generous, right? And so much of it is is just this belief in like the finite resources and the nature of competition. And I think if you can get out of that, if you can actually 
readjust your belief system to be like, look, there are plenty of people out there in the world who want to be involved with what we're doing, who are excited, who are generous. And my job is just to go find them as opposed to believing that they're really not out there. Then you just operate with a, a sense of ease, right? <laughs> Again, dating analogy, but I don't know if you ever had this problem, Patton, when you were single. When I was single, I would go through these periods of like, I couldn't catch a date to save my life, right? It was like a dry spell. And right. then the minute I had a boyfriend, like everyone wanted my number. Yes, and I was like, what, where were you when I was single? And the truth is a lot of it was the, the vibe I was putting out. The right. Like no one, like desperate energy is Doesn't not work. cute. Nobody likes that, right? Confident energy is what people like. If the confident energy is like, hey, we're doing this amazing thing and we'd love for you to come along if it if it's something that you care about too. And if not, like that's that's fine. That's so much more attractive. That's something that people really want to be. Like we, we want to be shoulder to shoulder with people who make us feel like, feel something, feel confident, feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. We don't want to be on a sinking ship. No one wants to be on the Titanic. Exactly right. Do not sign me up for a ticket for the Titanic. Indeed desperation fundraising doesn't work or if it does it's a go away money and you may yeah. get a little token amount from me but i'm not going to give again because of your desperation yeah. so i love that analogy all right so yeah. i call it i call that mariachi money you know, like mariachi thing. Exactly. Like, can you here's five dollars please, please go. yeah but go go <laughs> stop playing here go to somebody else's table yeah. right um yeah all right so how long does the program take your accelerated program and what generally is the time horizon your graduates come out. In other words, are you kind of gearing them toward, all right, let's let's look at the next 12 months, the next three months, the next three years, or I'm sure it varies, but just yeah. curious about timeline. Yeah, so, so it's interesting, Pat. So technically the, the bulk of it is a nine week program. So okay. it's about half an hour of content, about half an hour of, I call it homework, because uh, I come out yeah. of education and then, and then 90 minute uh, group coaching sessions. But the thing is, even after graduation, you have lifetime access to the Slack channel, lifetime access to all of the content up and upgrades. And then I do monthly drop-in sessions. Nice. So you can, I say like until the end of time, but I may have to <laughs> we'll <laughs> revise that, that time horizon at some point. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm always available. I try to really be uh, an ongoing resource. I you know try to make connections and introductions where appropriate because I'm really invested in my students' success. Like these are people who've trusted me with, with their time, their money, their energy, and I wanna deliver. That's awesome. Well, of course, we're gonna lift up in the show notes, uh, all of the resources you're talking about, in particular, your fundraising accelerator. But we also have something else fun to announce uh, as this episode is released. You got a book coming out. And as someone who is wrestling with a book project uh, myself, let's talk about it. Why'd you do it? What's the book about? Oh my goodness. So I, so <laughs> to be honest, Ben, I always wanted to write a book. I thought it would be the great American novel. It turns out it's actually a fundraising book. <laughs> Not totally surprised, Rhea, by that fact. Yeah, I know. I, I had this like vision that I would be like on a you know desert island somewhere in the Caribbean writing the great American novel, but that was not yeah. to be. Instead, it was uh, <laughs> in my apartment in Brooklyn, um, but it's called Get That Money, Honey, the No <laughs> BS Guide to Raising Money for Your Nonprofit. So it's a good, healthy dose of fun because I, I feel like, uh, and I don't know if you agree, but I feel like most fundraising books or most nonprofit books are so boring. Yes. Like I just, <laughs> not yours. Sad, but yours, yeah, ho amazing. hopefully not. <laughs> right. But, you know, they're very dry. They're like textbooks. I'm like, okay, first of all, we are not out here wanting to be bored <laughs> like you know we have we have i mean in terms of finite resources time is a finite resource so i'm not going to get more time so i'm going to make your time worthwhile um and really it's just a lot of the concepts that i teach in my accelerator so yeah. if you're the kind of person who can't afford the price tag for my accelerator like surely you can afford the price of a book but i think what a lot of people will find is that the concepts in the book are really deep and that the most effective way for you to really implement these strategies is to join the accelerator so yeah you know but look it's my mission is to help yeah well and right. really my mission is to help as many people in the world right so if like if you get the book and you're able to improve some of the practices like good that's that's all i wanted for you because i really as i was thinking about it i was writing the book for the 26 year old me who was totally clueless interesting 
Uh, I was yeah, going to so ask this you is exactly for, like, that. Li- yeah, this is for like little baby Ed Rhea who was doing the Google search about the da, 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 da. <laughs> what does an executive director do? Um, so get this book, and it at least will kind of you know help you to move in the right direction. Well, I'm glad, and that's a perfect segue to kind of the question. So you answer the question. The book is for someone thinking about fundraising. I'm sure, though, there's value for those that are already fundraisers, and you're going to give them a deeper dive. But I guess you're saying that, yeah, but if, if I'm thinking about nonprofit leadership and the fundraising component, this is a good book to read. I mean, it's a good book to read. The The concepts are pretty, I don't want to say advanced because that sounds uh, grandiose, but they're they're involved so i would say that it probably wouldn't make a ton of sense for the the novice or the beginner i think you yeah. have to have some you know some experience under your belt to really understand some of the concepts because like we talk about for example you know board management if you're a newbie like you may not even necessarily have had any experience with boards at all so right. i mean i think look i hope it, there's a little something for everybody, but I would say it's probably best suited for, you know, the first time executive director or the new development director who's, um, you know, has some experience, but not a ton and is really looking for ways to move the levers. Well, Ray, I'm delighted to lift that up. And it kind of adds to the resources you and I've talked about. You've got a podcast that is a wonderful resource. The book now is out. Of course, you've got the accelerator program. Uh, let me pose this kind of summary question to you, though. You run into a lot of people, I'm sure, like me, well-intentioned, thinking about getting into nonprofit leadership. You know, often I use the phrase, a lateral entry. Like, I'm sick of my for-profit job. Rhea, I'm sure I can save the world, right, if I can work a nonprofit. But I, I don't mean to be, you know, crass about it. But how, how do you advise someone thinking about nonprofit leadership? Oh, <laughs> You've been there. <laughs> so like, yeah, I've been there. You've been there. Okay. So a couple things here. I, it's actually like very offensive to me when people say that. Yep. Because I think there's this pervasive assumption that somehow being a nonprofit is easier than Agreed. being in corporate, right? Um, so for me, it's actually offensive because it assumes that, oh, you can just jump, jump into a nonprofit and be automatically good at it with no experience necessary because the bar is so low, right? So usually what I advise people is, you know, number one, before you make the jump, like, how about you volunteer? Like, how about you, or like join a board or see what's actually out there, right? And then secondly, you know, what tangible skills do you think that you can bring to accelerate the sector because I think this other idea is I'll just I'll just like join up and everyone will automatically see how amazing I am be like there'll be a ticker tape parade in my honor because I decided to join the nonprofit field and I'm like I'm sorry no one's giving you a Nobel Prize right now yes calm down (laughs) (laughs) yeah I I think you and I share the this bee in our bonnets right? Uh, yeah. Because you have more than one, every one of them is worthy of uh, a sting. Uh, but yeah, for me, Rhea, it was, uh, I, I first worked for the Special Olympics organization in DC. And mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. distinctly people kind of saying, oh, yeah, you know, pat me on the head. Good for you, Pat. And, but when are you going to get a real job? And so I, yeah. I, I, I could not agree more with your point that there is in fact, almost a dismissal of the sector as not being mm-hmm. a real job. And that's why you are quick to, I guess, knock somebody back who, while their intentions might be good, they really don't know what they're getting into. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the other thing too, Patton, is I've actually had people, like I know people who went from corporate to nonprofit and, and they're like, wow, this is really hard. Like, Harder <laughs> even, right? Imagine you have to do all of the same kind of things with a fraction of the budget that you had. <laughs> good point. And that's why I actually think that the folks in the nonprofit sector are some of the most you know, innovative, agile, interesting people because they have to make it work. They're really inventive. They know how to, you know, they know how to make a penny scream. They know how to like just rig something up to make it work. And I think that kind of ingenuity and innovation is actually what makes our sector really great. It's fantastic. Uh, again, thank you. Great resources all around. Obviously, we're going to lift up Get That Money, Honey, as a book <laughs> for your future uh, bookshelf. Um, any of the books, you know, Rhea, I ask every guest this, has there been a book or book a book or books that have been particularly helpful to you on your journey that you might recommend to our listeners as well? 
Yeah, I have a couple. So I was thinking about this. Um, I'm a big fan of Atomic Habits it's by James Clear. Good one. If you're familiar. Good it's one. a good one. And it's about how to how to start new habits and break bad ones because really at the end of the day, fundraising is just habits, right? It's just like, are you keeping track of your donors? Are you reaching out? Are you sending the, you know, the acknowledgement letters? Are you sending the reminders? Like it's just little habits that build up to success. Yes. What, yes. What's that phrase? I'm going to butcher it. But if like, if you're doing the right little things, then the score will take care of itself. Right. Yep. So big kind of atomic habits. Um, love Victor Frankl's man's search for meaning. Because I think at the end of the day, all of us need to wrestle with our own why. Like we all need to find the thing that gives our life meaning and purpose. And it's not, I mean, I guess for some people it's, it's about money, but certainly in this sector, I think we we're a bit loftier, right? Like we, we like to believe that our lives have meant something to somebody and that we're yes. going to leave behind something that has improved someone's life in some way. So that's a big one. And then, um, you know, I think the other thing is we really as a sector need to also find ways to lighten up a little bit. So I'm a big fan of fiction. Um, so my favorite book is The God of Small Things by Aaron Dottie Roy. Um, and it's just a fantastically written book. It won the Booker Prize back in the late 90s. And, you know, I really recommend because I, I feel like burnout is so pervasive in our sector. But give your brain some time to rest, like read Good fiction and, and don't, you know, and by rest, I don't mean like binge on Netflix, even though like, <laughs> look, I've done that too. Yeah, but uh, like guilty, your, yeah, guilty brain, as George. Yeah. yeah, but I think your brain needs to, to play and be creative. So fantastic. Those are three books. A trio, yeah. a trio, a bonus trio of books in addition to your own and in fact, I'm glad you let off with Atomic Habits. In fact, we put that in the gift package to our mastermind group because I am a fan oh, of wonderful. that as well. So that was part of their initial welcome to the program. Uh, and here's some recommendations. Uh, so thank you for lifting it up as well, Rhea. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know the final question, Rhea. Where can people find out more about you and the great work you're doing across multiple platforms? Yeah, thanks for that, Pat. Um, so, you know, the place to go is my website, riawong.com, R-H-E-A-W-O-N-G. Uh, I can be found on LinkedIn, but the way if you want to keep abreast on all of the things that are happening, plus you get cute dog photos of my dog, Stevie Wonder, uh, definitely sign up for my newsletter. And you, you get weekly updates and a little bit of inspiration for your day. Fantastic, Ria. Thank you again for joining me on the path. Thank you so much, Fadden. It's been a pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Rhea as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas that can help you with that most critical skill of fundraising. Don't forget about the show notes available on our website, patentmcdowell.com. You can find out more about Rhea, all of the resources on her website, riawong.com, her podcast, her book, and her fundraising accelerator program. Lots to check out there. Again, go to patmcdowell.com forward slash podcast, and you can get to this and any of now 150 podcast episodes. Of course, Rhea and I both would love for you to share this episode with someone else on the leadership path. And if you're not a subscriber yet to this podcast, please consider doing so. Go to patmcdowell.com, go to the podcast page, and you can click on the big follow button. Follow equals subscribe. Don't miss out on any of these weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday. And if you want to check out any of the previous now 149 episodes, just click on the episodes button on that same podcast page. And you can see thumbnail briefs of every episode and enjoy as you are able. Thanks again for all you are doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. And keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time on The Path. Mm -hmm.